Well, that's uh, those are some of the top uh, business uh, stories now we're tracking at this time. But let's get into our conversation today. President Bola Tinubu has presented a proposed 2024 budget earlier today to the joint section of the National Assembly, which he described as budget of renewed hope. Uh, the proposed budget for 2024 was revised upwards by 1.5 trillion naira to 27.5 uh, trillion naira. That's more than 32.7 billion dollars, with an oil price assumption of 77 uh, dollars uh, per barrel and assumed currency value of 750 uh, naira per dollar. The president stated that the government will set aside more than 7 trillion naira for debt service, with the target of 18. Uh, more than 18 trillion naira uh, revenue target. The president is also targeting 3.75% uh, GDP growth for next year with inflation target of 21.4%. In swearing in my cabinet and reflecting on the unique challenges facing us, I invited the ministers to imagine that we are attempting to draw water from a dry well. Today, I stand before you to present our budget of renewed hope, a budget which will go further than ever before. The 2024 appropriation has been themed budget of renewed hope. Well, let's get some uh, expert perspective on this now. I'm being joined by Mr. Johnson Chuku, uh, the GMD and CEO of Carry Asset Management, uh, for some perspective on this. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Johnson Chuku. We appreciate you for coming on board. Well, um, let's start from the um, budget assumption with the president presentation of the 2024 appropriation bill. The economy looks set for another fiscal year, uh, paving way for planning. So let me ask you, how would you react? Thank you, Frank, for having me. Um, yeah. My reaction to the budget assumptions are one, some of them are realistic, some may be difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the uh, key uh, assumptions of the budget. It's, there is an exchange rate projection of, say, 50 naira to a dollar. That for me is a bit conservative, but it's uh, better to be conservative when you are taking up uh, revenue projections. Um, two, you have a, a crude oil production benchmark of 1.78 uh, million barrels a day. That is quite optimistic. That would be difficult to achieve, given where we are today. And given the social environment, or social economic environment of the country, particularly around the Niger Delta region where crude is produced. I'll come back to that. The other key assumption is um, the uh, inflation rate. Inflation rate at 1%. I believe the inflation rate should moderate in 2024, because when you measure inflation, you measure change in average prices between a benchmark year and the subsequent year. So we are going to be using price levels in 2023 as a benchmark for arriving at the inflation rate based on price levels in 2024. So I think we're going to see a moderation in that coming from the fact that we, are not, we should expect the level of devaluation of the currency that we saw this year. And hopefully, uh, we should be expect an improvement in, uh, in food production. The other key assumption is in terms of uh, crude price. There is a crude price projection of $77 per barrel. I think that it should also reasonably be uh, achievable, based uh, depending on what happens in the global uh, oil, oil market space. Uh, if you see, if we are using the current uh, environment today to judge what should happen last next year, we should see crude price trade out at above average price of seventy seven dollars per barrel. So those are the key assumptions: crude price projection realistic, um, exchange rate projection relatively conservative, uh, but uh, crude oil production. Uh, overly optimistic. But the challenge you have is that a lot of assumptions is built around the crude oil production, which will determine it also affect your exchange rate. If crude production is not achieved, then you're going to have a major volume variance. Even if you have a marginal price, positive price variance, we have, but you have a huge negative volume variance, you're going to have a revenue uh, um, achievement, actual revenue uh, below the projected revenue of 18.2 trillion naira. And once you have that, everything will be a struggle. You have to either borrow further to meet that revenue shortfall. So in that case, your debt service will also increase uh, beyond what you are projecting in the, in, in the budget. Mm. 
But, but uh, do you think that this align with uh, the president's economic agenda? If you look at where the president is currently focused in terms of uh, priorities uh, for him, uh, so do you think these numbers you put out there align uh, with his economic uh, you know, agenda? Well, let me start from uh, uh, one of the key uh, projections of the president. Uh, that is that we're going to achieve uh, um, a GDP size of one trillion dollars by 2030, which is uh, seven years from now. Uh, but then, the projected GDP growth is about 3.76% for 2024. Uh, and then, if you take the medium-term expenditure framework as a basis, and then the projected GDP growth rate for 2025 is 4.22%. Further down the line, the projected GDP growth rate for 2026 is about 4.76%, which means the first three years of the president's tenure, the GDP is greater than less than 5%. If the GDP is greater than less than 5%, the GDP is just in the region of $400 billion, then you cannot achieve the long-term uh, projected size of the GDP of $1 trillion even in the next 20 years. That uh, is one of the things that in developing the budget uh, assumptions, they should have also looked at the overarching objective of the government, which they say they want to have a GDP economy with the size of $1 trillion. At current projected growth rate contained in the current year, the 2024 budget and the entire medium term expenditure framework, you will not achieve uh, in the next seven years a GDP of $1 trillion. And I, I think that's, for me, is the most overarching uh, economic pronouncement that the president has made. In terms of uh, investment infrastructure, we need to come up, we need to come up with a strategy to invest in infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> projection of about 5.6 trillion naira in the out of the 27 trillion, 27.5 trillion naira, which is about 20 billion of the uh, budgeted expenditure, will not scratch the surface in terms of funding infrastructure. Mm. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, a bit about uh, government's <coughs> uh, fiscal and uh, sust uh, debt sustainability position. I mean, debt service is more than. Uh, seven or eight trillion are going to, and that's going to take a, a lot if you look at the deficit, uh, which is more than nine trillion and revenue generation target of 18 trillion. How much pressure is on fiscal policies with regards to spending uh, next year? You know, um, if you look at um, the projected um, expenditure and you want to now break it into the different components, I did mention earlier that um, record, uh, capital expenditure of 5.6 trillion. Uh, uh, debt service, based on what is actually contained in the medium expenditure framework, is about 10 point, 10 point 6 trillion naira. So, <clears throat> if you look at that, it simply means debt service will account for about um, 56 percent of government revenue, and that simply means they are going to crowd out. And then, if you take out capital expenditure of 5.6 trillion naira of the 27 point, um, uh, 27.5 trillion naira. Um, over um, 90 trillion, we go into recorded expenditure. I've mentioned the company that are going to um, into, into debt service. Excuse me. <laughs> so that means that government will continue to develop that pressure in terms of recorded expenditure. And then we should ask ourselves how do we cut down recorded expenditure? We need to hear government make announcements on or pronouncements on how to cut down on um, the uh, up to or what you may call the excessive um, um, government um, structures, particularly as it relates to the overlapping ministries and departments. We've been on this for God knows how long. I mean, Simon Obama just said that when we came up with the Russian report and we said we're going to harmonize overlapping ministries and departments. We've not been able to do that for the past 24 years. So if the government wants to cut down the current expenditure, they need to cut down that. The other aspect is in terms of uh, government policy as it relates to um, funding uh, the overhead of uh, public servants. If you recall, under Bassett's government, the government came up with what they call monetization of uh, benefits in kind. So things like government properties were sold out, uh, government uh, now began to pay cash in lieu of vehicles for government officials. I think we should go back to that. The simple reason is that if you have uh, an amount, a amount for a permanent secretary or a, a minister, and the minister had to pay for his vehicles. The minister not going to have a long convoy of vehicles. They are doing that because the running costs of those convoys are not borne 
by the minister. They are born for public posts. And when you talk of um, inflated um, recurrence, which is coming from all this uh, uh, lifestyle or structure of governance. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Johnson, Chico, I don't know if you can hear me, but I would like to... Okay, can you hear me? I would like to follow... Yes, I can hear you. Okay. J just quickly allow me to follow up with this question. There are a school of thought, uh, I think it's economic theories, um, that believes that you need to allow the civil servant to earn more. So if you cut down uh, on, um, you know, recurrent expenditure, um, how do you think you can balance, because you're trying to look at empowering um, Nigerians, and that way you can increase the purchasing power of average Nigerians. So how do you balance, you know, between having to cut down on a borrowing or, or expenditure, and of course, also um, improving the lives of the citizenry? Okay, let's take the first part of your question, which is basically <coughs> allowing that the public servants to earn more so that they will be more productive. If you have to achieve, the focus should be actually productivity of everybody in the economic space, including public servants and private sector workers. So but focusing on the public sector workers, yes, you want to pay minimum wage, you want to pay compensation and commensurate with the level of contribution and level of productivity of the uh, uh, employee. If that has to be the case, then you also may not need to have the number of headcounts you have today. So you need to rationalize. And um, because what we have now is a public servant or civil servant that is basically populated by people who are just there to earn a, a living. Many of them don't even come to work. So you, first thing that you need to carry out an audit of the public servant employees or civil servants, and also carry out a skill set assessment and identify those who have the competencies and pay them something materially higher than what they are paid today so that they will focus on the job and be productive. But you will end up saving some money uh, if you do that. Then if you look at the general economy, then you are talking of how do you incentivize consumption as, as well as to, so as to support productive activities or support demand. If you come from creating structure that one employed those who are currently not employed, and that's where public work comes in. Uh, but first, the government does not have the resources to go into massive public works. And if the government ha doesn't have the resources to, for, to invest in public works from budgetary allocation, the next thing to do is to bring in private capital into that. So we need to identify some commercially viable infrastructure and concession in private sector operators to build. In building them, they were going to employ labor from the, uh, uh, from the, um, from the society and create another set of uh, income which will stimulate consumption, that will stimulate production, and that will lead, allow the economy to expand. Mm. Let's talk about the inflation target of the president. I mean, with inflation target of 21.4%, uh, and of course, currently inflation is at uh, 20 uh, uh, year high. Yes, yes, yes. So, but currently it's at 27.33%. So, what priority areas should the government focus to address the inflationary pressures and alleviate the burden on citizens? Uh, if you say, okay, they don't have to, I mean, they have to cut down. It doesn't necessarily that they have to, um, you know, increase salary for workers to enjoy themselves. Okay, let me mention this. The shortest way to uh, bring down inflation is to improve productivity, to improve the volume of value of goods produced uh, within an economy without necessarily increasing the cost of production. So what, that's what I talk about productivity. One, we need to improve the productivity of the, of the agricultural sector. And the starting point is to fight the, to deal with the issue of insecurity in some of the major food base of the country, not central, not east, and not west. If we deal with the issue of um, insecurity, you're going to see increase in the level of food production. Remember that food inflation is the greatest driver of inflation in the country. Um, so if you see that improvement in food production, you're going to see a moderation in food inflation, which would overall affect the all item inflation. The other aspect is uh, energy, infl infl um, energy, energy cost. Um, I don't expect that to materially increase next year because like I said earlier, I don't expect the level of devaluation we saw this year to also happen next year. So if we do not have material devaluation next year, uh, import-induced inflation will moderate. The third leg of it is government borrowing by ways and means, which ingests liquidity that is not supported by productive activities. Government had, should, has, has to cut down. We need to go back and implement what the Fiscal Responsibility Act and the Central Bank Act says are, 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 are on lending to the federal government by ways and means. 
If we do that, we are going to reduce the level of liquidity suffix we witness the economy that is driven by ways and means funding. Those three components are factors that will drive down inflation in 2024. Mm. I mean, the IMF, I mean, I read a report where IMF suggested that uh, the central bank, you know, should focus on core uh, mandates of, I mean, of its, yes, its, its core mandate and also uh, to allow, you know, the bank, the commercial banks to, to step in in terms of, uh, you know, exchange rate market to fix their own exchange rate uh, in that regard. But if you look at that, how possible is that and what is the impact of that? Because um, exchange rate at the moment, uh, based on this benchmark and this presentation, is around 750 um, naira to one US dollar. Well, let's look at uh, the issue of the central bank um, uh, remaining focus on the primary mandate, which is that of um, price stability, which the central bank governor has said repeatedly, that the central bank will perform unorthodox uh, monetary interventions and focus on its primary mandate. Some of the unorthodox interventions include the, the lending that they've granted to several sectors of the economy, the likes of our program, commercial agricultural credit scheme, and what have you. And they will focus on. They will also focus on inflation targeting. Um, that should be the primary role of the central bank. The primary focus of the central bank. Of course, that is possible uh, once they have uh, the buy-in of the executive. The previous central bank governors had, at some point in time, intervened uh, with what they call the green finance initiatives, but they ended up injecting liquidity into economy at subsidized rates. Um, in terms of the banks being in a position to manage. Uh, for the bank to avail the term banks enough liquidity, FS liquidity to manage uh, the FX market, the central bank doesn't have the liquidity to stay. The central bank has not made areas of what made demand. The key thing that we are talking of, we are going to go into the likes of what we had, the effective uh, is implementation of the what they call the um, um, uh, the exchange rate mechanism, what with the central bank has been trying to implement. Um, and the challenge you have that is that you don't have liquidity. Without liquidity, the banks, you can't have uh, uh, offer rate and bid rate that should happen in the market. Ideally, when the market opens, um, a bank should come to the market with its offer rate and bid rate, uh, hoping that at the offer rate, if you make it, uh, if you if you make enough uh, bid to you to buy from them, they will supply to you. Hello, Mr. Chuku, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, my goodness. I think we have uh, lost connection with... Uh, but when we do establish connection with uh, Mr. Johnson Chuku, we'll, of course, we'll, we'll bring we'll it. it oh, okay, great. We have you back. Please continue. Okay, what I was saying that for you to have um, uh, a perfect market or a market where the, center, the banks, commercial banks are the one, major participants in the FS market, there must be liquidity. Mm -hmm. And the liquidity will come from... The, what you call the market maker. Today, the central bank remains the market maker because the central bank is the recipient of Nigeria's foreign exchange earnings from crude oil sales. So if you have a market maker that has liquidity, then the banks can become major participants in the market because the bank, on a daily basis, the FH trader would go to the market uh, and then submit his bid rate and offer rates. His bid rate simply means that um, if you um, supply me uh, FX at this rate, I will buy and the offer rate is, I'm offering to sell FX to anybody who is in the market that wants to buy at this rate. Okay. And that's what, okay. what is missing because you don't have liquidity in the market. All right. Uh, just, just before I let you go quickly, I mean, I asked that question earlier because I was, you know, wanted us to look at how the central bank can come in uh, in terms of uh, the complementary role that they play uh, with the fiscal authorities. But just before I let you go, uh, what are you looking at with regards to allocations for key sectors such as education, healthcare, infrastructure development to improve the lives of ordinary uh, Nigerians? You know, specifically education, you know, because we have an unskilled population that is growing at more than 3% annually. I think we should wrap up quickly on that note. Well, on education, I think uh, beyond the monetary uh, allocation to it, because the SFI is always to focus on monetary allocation. Yeah, we need to increase the budgetary allocation to education to the region of 20%. But beyond that, we must also get value for the money we spend. We need to go back and review our curriculum. 
Our curriculum has to be in tandem with global best curriculum, which is STEM, science, education, engineering, technology, and mathematics. We need to go and adopt that. We need to have proper supervision so that when money is spent, we get value for it. Those things are missing that if you are throwing money at any sector in the economy today without proper supervision, then you are not getting full value for money. Mm. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Johnson Chuku, the GMD and CEO, uh, Kauri Asset Management. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.